right. This morning we kick off a brand new series on the book of Jonah. And so if you're a kid, you are dismissed into kids' worship. And while they're dismissing, hopefully you received a worship guide. Um, when you came in this morning, a lot of good information on that. On the back of that worship guide is an opportunity for you to take notes. And so I want to encourage you to do that as we kick off a brand new series on the book of Jonah. But first, I want to celebrate. Uh, God is doing a lot of incredible things, man. It is uh, an awesome opportunity every single Sunday, but especially this Sunday as we celebrated four baptisms. I mean, come on. That's awesome. Um, Let us not forget um, why we do what we do, and that's for people to say yes to Jesus Christ. In in everything we do, that is the main thing. Uh, And just an awesome celebration and testimony that we get to see Dale uh, baptize two of his family, have his family here, his former pastor here, and so, man, great things. I also want to celebrate, last week we had Discover Southside. Discover Southside is an opportunity for you to find out more about our church, ask questions, get to know people, but also an opportunity to partner and join us in the mission that God has given us And we had 13 people join last week. Amen. That's awesome. And so, uh, and several others that were there. But here's the really cool thing. In in less than a year, we've seen 63 people join our church. I mean, that's that's incredible. And that's not including the um, hundreds, really, of of, of first-time guests. And so, um, it's hard to memorize all those names. I'm with you. And so uh, at the welcome desk, we've got a a pamphlet with all the new members' names and faces, and it's just a good opportunity for you to be, first off, reminded of what God is doing and the people that God is bringing and the people that God is connecting, but also for you to get to know them and connect with them and say, hey, and so uh, exciting things are happening here at Southside. But uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Jonah. Open up and turn to the book of Jonah. It's right between Obadiah and Micah. I'm sure that helped you, right? Uh, No, Jonah is tucked in there with all these books that sound like Star Wars characters, right, Franklin? You got Obadiah, Jonah, Obi-Wan, Micah, Nahum, and Chewbacca. And so... uh, (laughs) I'm excited to kick off this series uh, in the book of Jonah. Jonah is a short book, but four chapters. And so for the next four weeks, we're going to dive through a chapter of Jonah, walk through it, expository, verse to verse, chapter by chapter. And my prayer this morning and for the next four weeks is that God speaks into your heart through these words, through this chapter, through this passage of scripture, because we believe that, that God's word is living and it's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, and I don't know what you came in this room with, the situations, the circumstances, the difficulties, but I believe in a God that meets you exactly where you're at, and he can speak directly to your heart and mind, I promise you that, and that's our prayers. We just finished a series called Friend Request, and I heard so many great practical things about that series and, and how you enjoyed it, but also you applied it to your life. I want to remind you, you can always go back on our YouTube channel, share a message, re-watch a message as it pulls to the heartstrings of, of who you are. And so, but Jonah, we're going to dive in in Jonah 1 verse 1, all right? Hopefully you have your Bibles. If you don't, the uh, verses are going to be behind me on the screens. But it says this. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh. I want us to stop right there because there's several things that I want us to understand about this story. But a lot of times, if you know anything about the book of Jonah, you know it's about a big fish, right? Like the book of Jonah gets a a, a label, a perception of that's, that's what it's about. It's about this big fish. But in reality, I want us to understand right from the beginning, it's about the presence of God. It's not about a fish. In fact, when you do kind of dive in a little bit deeper in the four chapters, fish is only mentioned four times. But the presence of God is mentioned over 38. 
It's about God's patience, God's mercy, God's grace. He's the God of second chances. Or if you're like me, a thousand chances, right? That, that's who God is. And, and so we see that, that the book of Jonah is all about the presence of God. The story of Jonah is not a myth. It's not a parable as some people think it is. But in fact, this information that we see in the book of Jonah, especially in the beginning parts of chapter 1, it's written as history. It's historical. Second Kings in the Old Testament identifies Jonah as a real person. He's a prophet that God used to do incredible things through his life and ministry. The other thing to note is that Jesus referred to this historical events that we see in Jonah as a very important prophetical sign for his own ministry. Look what it says in Matthew 12, verse 41. The first book of the gospel, the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with the generation and condemn it. This is historical. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. This is prophetic, calling that all the things in Jonah was real, it was historic, but Jesus is coming. Jesus is here, and Jesus is greater than Jonah. He's the greatest person you can ever encounter and the greatest experience you can ever have in your life. Jesus is greater. And we see this in just the first verse of Jonah. But as we continue to read in Jonah 1 verse 2, it says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Two things to know about the city of Nineveh. Number one, it was a great city. It was a massive city. Theologians, commentaries say for you to go to one side of the metroplex to the other side, it would would take you three days to walk. And so it was a a big city. It was a massive city. Um, Architectural, culture, entertainment, it it was known for that. But just like a lot of great cities and big cities... It was also a very wicked city. In fact, the Ninevites were known as some of the cruelest people in the ancient world. They boasted in graphic pictures of cruelty, not just death, but they were known for raping women and killing them and boasting and posting it for every single person to see. They were very wicked, very dark city. And and God calls to Jonah and says, arise, I want you to go to that city, and I want you to call them out on it. Sign me up, right? No. Difficult. So just put yourself in Jonah's situation. But also for Jonah, this is a little deeper than just that. Nineveh's primary target was Israel which means Jonah and his people were victims of the Ninevite cruelty. And so this was a little deeper than just this being a wicked city. This meant a little bit more to him as a lot of his friends and people were were victims of the Ninevites. As we continue to read in verse 3, But Jonah rose... To flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it. To go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. So Jonah says, I know you've called me to this, but I'm not going. I'm actually running far, far, far from it, 1,500 miles away from what you called me to go. So like from here to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. So it's not like, ah, no, I don't want to do that. I'm going to go to Jacksonville, Texas. Like, no, I I am so against what you're calling me to do. I'm a prophet. I'm close to you. I know you've worked in my life in ministry. I've seen a lot of amazing things that you've done in your life, but I'm not doing this to to so far that I'm running far and fleeing far from your presence. I want nothing to do with it. 
Some commentaries and theologians actually will uh, parallel Jonah's success in ministry during Israel's finest hours to what Billy Graham did in the United States. God was working in his life. An amazing premier prophet that God was using in powerful ways. But here we start to see the rebellion against God. And you can see that on the screen. It says, this is what rebellion is. Rebellion is just no to God. No. That's rebellion. I'm doing against what you've called me to do. Now, culturally speaking, we evaluate our walk with God by comparing how godly we are to others. I go to church more than you do. The national average now attending church is just a little over once a month for someone that considers themselves connected. Now, thankfully, we don't have that here at Southside, but we we do this culturally and and in our lives. I, I go to church more than you, so I know more. Or God speaks to me more, and so I, I'm, I'm closer to him. Or I might know a little bit more knowledge about scripture, and so uh, we just compare our walk with Christ with other people. But something we need to realize this morning, lordship is above all. And lordship is one of those things that if it's not absolute and total, it's not real. And one thing I do want you to write down if you're taking notes this morning, you're never farther away, you're never farther from God than when you're close to him and you say no. You are never farther away from the presence of God when you're close to him and you say no. It's easy for for someone to say no to God when they're not close to him, when they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. When they're, when, they're, when they're in the beginning stages of the relationship, it's easy to say no and distant yourself and run away in those situation circumstances. But when you're close to God and you've been following after him and God is using you in powerful ways and you're just a mission field for the kingdom and you say no to God, that's dangerous. It's why apathy is one of the biggest things that churches struggle with all across the country. Apathy is a sense of, I don't care. I've grown up to church my whole life, and I, it's, it's, it's this presence of God that I just can't even feel anymore. That's what apathy is, and that's the hardest place to be. And there are a lot of godly people who look like they are walking with God in every other way. But there's some area that they're saying no to him in. For some of you, maybe that's a relationship. We just got done with a series on relationships and friendships and community. And there's someone in your life that you know that you need to run away from and remove. You need to quit it, but yet you can't do it. Maybe it's a sacrifice God has put on your heart. A gift of generosity to a ministry area or a family in need, and you have it. And God's asking you and and, and telling you and speaking to you to give it, but yet you want to hold on to it. Or maybe it's sin that's owning and distracting your life and entangling your heart and you just can't confess it. And maybe, just maybe, it's maybe God is calling you to go somewhere, is leading you into full-time ministry, but you're struggling to go and put your yes on the table. All of us come into this room with different backgrounds, different family dynamics, all walks of different stages of life, and yet all of us struggle to go all in with Jesus Christ. There's some areas of our life that we'll give God, but there's some areas of life that he can't have access to. And for Jonah, that was one of those that we'll dive deep into that. And later in this chapter. But it also says, notice, it also says when Jonah fled to Tarshish, notice that he went to Joppa and it says that he found a ship ready. He found a ship ready. It's like his plan of action, things made sense and was working out. 
I know God's called me to go here and speak to Nineveh, but I'm going to go this way. And while I'm disobeying God and walking away from God's presence, I find a ship that's ready. And so in my mind, in my flesh, maybe it's God speaking to me saying, get on the ship. I'm making actions. I'm, I'm taking steps into providing for you. And we do this all the time in our situations and circumstances. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had this week alone where people are doing something clearly against the will of God and they're like, but look, all this just worked out and things are coming together. I've talked to people this week in the midst of adultery, emotionally and physically, and they say, well, I was miserable in my marriage and then I met this person. I felt like that was God wanting me to be happy. And I found a ship that's just ready. But in fact, it could be the enemy laying a trap for your life. I want you to write this down. If you want to run from God, there will always be a ship ready for you to take. If you want to run from God, from the presence of God, the face of God, there will always be a ship ready for you to take because that's, we have a real enemy that has a role. His significant role is to ready the ship for your disobedience. That's it. He wants to distract you from the purpose and plan that God has for your life, and he wants to distract you from that in such a way that maybe sometimes he'll give you peace for that in your flesh. Look what it says in Genesis 3. We all know the fall of man, but the enemy gave peace to Adam and Eve that the fruit to eat was good. It was good. He gave them peace about disobeying to God. That peace in your heart may not be God's affirmation of what you're doing. It may be Satan numbing your conscience as it leads you down a path towards death. Don't look at peace in your heart. Look at God's word because God's word never changes. It's the same yesterday, it's the same today, and it's the same tomorrow. Jesus never fails so if you're questioning God's direction and guidance, don't look to something, don't look to someone, but look to God's word. Is it bringing affirmation in your life? Because there will always be a ship that's ready for you to take to disobey what God's calling you to do. And in Jonah's sense, this is exactly what's going on. He wanted nothing to do with it. He knew it was a call from God. But he kept walking down the next steps that was just being available to him. And sometimes those next steps are not steps of God. They're steps of the enemy. Verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it from it. But Jonah had gone down. If you have a Bible, you're, you have something to write with, just underline that. He'd gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. And so here we see in this situation, all these pagan sailors are scared out of their mind, which they should be, right? Right? A massive uh, windstorm, crazy things going on, and they're, they're terrified. And so they, 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 they say to everybody, hey, pray out to, to your God. I don't know who your God is, but if everybody prays out to their God, maybe we'll get lucky and something will happen. But it's crazy to think that Jonah, who knows the real God, who's a prophet of God, is downstairs asleep. How ironic. Now, this word down that I have you just um, underlined, it's mentioned multiple times in, in just this segment, but it says down to Joppa, down to the inner part, down into sleep. This, 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 this Hebrew word sleep is kind of, it's not snoozing. It's a deep sleep. 
and it's a sleep of death to the point of it's a spiritual disaster. And so we see Jonah. God is calling Jonah to, to do something, to go somewhere. And Jonah rebels. Jonah disobeys. And it's always a small disobedient step that leads to a spiritual disaster in your life. Nobody in a million years would, would look back on your life, a situation, a circumstance, a past chapter, uh, people that are so far from God and done some extremely terrible things. They would never look at you and say, oh yeah, I, I pictured myself being there. I pictured divorcing my wife. I pictured being in jail. I pictured being doped out on someone's couch because I OD'd on drugs. It all starts with a small step of disobedience that leads into a spiritual disaster. My wife says all the time, you are one step away from a different life. One compromise away from a different life. And this is a man that is a prophet of God. A premier prophet that God is using in powerful ways. And because of the situation and circumstances at hand, it's too big for him. to. He says, I'm not doing it. I'm running. And that small step led to small step, led to small step, till we see, context-wise, it's a spiritual disaster right now. In verse 6, So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? We're out here praying to our gods, and you're... Sleeping, arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we might may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on, on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on, imagine this, Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? You can imagine Jonah saying, you know what? I, this is ridiculous. I can't do this anymore. And he said to them, I am Hebrew. And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven. Who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid. Not that they were afraid before, but now they're really afraid. And said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he told them. And so Jonah rebelled. Small step of disobedience led to a place and a situation that they're in now that affects not just himself, but other people. In fact, write this down if you're taking notes. Our disobedience affects others. Your sin affects other people. It does. Your disobedience, your sin, we never sin in private. For some of you, your family and your friends are suffering because of your disobedience. And maybe you're suffering in this room because of someone else's disobedience. I love the illustration that they, if anybody ever been on a plane, most of us have, it makes no sense why you would put your oxygen mask on before someone else's. But in the same breath, it does because you have got to be okay before you save someone else. And here's the key in this passage of scripture. If you are passed out spiritually, you're going to kill those around you. Your disobedience and your sin doesn't just affect you. It affects every single person that's close to you. Your failure to walk with God has eternally devastating consequences. Your kids that grow up that are all about material things, it's because maybe you're all about material things. Your, your kids growing up and maybe struggling to make God a priority in their life for them to go all in, maybe because you're struggling to do that. The sin and disobedience in your life and the situations and circumstances that are affecting you could possibly be at hand for other people around you. And we see this in Jonah. Jonah's sin, Jonah's rebellion, 
Jonah's disobedience is affecting every single person that was on that boat that just probably wanted to have a good time. In verse 11, then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous, turbulent. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous and turbulent against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood for you. O Lord, have done it as pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Not a whale, a great fish. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So we see Jonah knew what was happening in this situation and circumstance. He knew that his rebellion, his sin, his disobedience had massive effect on every single person that was on that boat. And he finally just said, I'm going to submit. I'm tired of running anymore. I know God is everywhere. There's nowhere I can go that God won't see me and know what I'm doing. I've tried. 1,500 miles away, I've got on on a ready ship. I went down to the inner part. And finally, just, just hurl me into the sea. Because I know I'm the reason of where you're at right now. Only way to survive this storm is to submit to God. If Jonah continued to fight the storm and God, it would have killed him and others. And so Jonah, Jonah submitted and it saved him. Because he ran back to the presence of of God. And so for the remainder of our time this morning, as we look through Jonah 1, as we dive into this series and continue to lead in this series the next few weeks, I want to give you two reminders about this book and how it parallels so much of the gospel. Number one, the book of Jonah shows you what a real sinner is. The book of Jonah shows you what a real sinner is. Now, Jonah has the knowledge. He has the experience. He's a prophet. He's successful in ministry. He just didn't want to do what God has called him to do. He knew what God called him to do, knew the plan for his life, knew the race for his life, but he didn't want to do it. Two things were going to happen in this situation. He, he was in a dilemma. Two things were going to happen. Number one, Nineveh wouldn't repent. Jonah would go to Nineveh. They would say, you're crazy and stupid, and they would kill him. Because they're cruel people. And that's what they were known for. And his pictures would have been everywhere for people to see, don't mess with us. And Jonah knew that that was a possibility. But he also knew that, what if Nineveh would repent? What if I went there and they would repent and then they wouldn't be destroyed, which would be bad for him and bad for Israel because they were victims of this group of people and they didn't like them. Selfishly, Jonah wanted them destroyed. And so he knew either way, because of his flesh, because of his situation, it was a bad place for him to be in. If Jonah obeyed God here, he'd either lose his life or he'd lose his position of status in his identity. For him, that was the main thing. He was used by God, but his position of status and his identity was everything to him. 
Jonah would have to obey God until it required him obeying God in the areas of his life that mattered most, the areas of life that defined him. Very similar, we see this in the New Testament with the rich young ruler. God puts the rich young ruler in front of a mirror and says, okay, you know the things, you know everything, but come follow me when you get rid of this. What's the one thing that, that's in your life that's keeping you from being all in with Jesus? Jesus doesn't want some, he wants everything. And so that's the question for you. Most of us, most of us are religious in this room. In some way or fashion, are you willing to obey God if it costs you everything? Even if it takes away from the last, from that thing which is most precious to you, that defines your purpose, your identity. And Jonah ran away from the presence of the Lord, face of God. He knew he couldn't get away from God. And this is a parallel that also we see in Daniel 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we see that same dilemma. I obey God, I'm thrown into the fiery furnace and I die. I don't, I deny God, I, I don't do what God is calling me to do and I live. But the question we have to ask ourselves this morning, would you rather be in the flames with God or in the safety without him? Or here's another question, would you rather have the joy of God, even if it means obeying God in a difficult situation, or have the benefits of disobeying God, disobedience without God? Will you follow God? How is he speaking to you, leading you? And the reason I can say, the reason all of us hopefully at one point in time can say yes to that is because he's worthy of it. He's greater. He's the greatest experience and the greatest person we can ever encounter in our life. And I know that he has a plan for my life. And I know I could trust him with everything of who I am. No matter what happens, situation, circumstance, people that come and go away from my life. I know I could put my faith and trust in him. And I could put my yes on the table. So whatever God is calling you to do, this is not a picture of just Jonah's sin, but our sin. Our sin in our life, our sin in this room, all of us come in this room with one thing in common. We've missed the mark of perfection. And every sin demands a sacrifice. And we come into this room broken before a real God. And the story of Jonah lets us know who the real sinner is. That's us. That's you, and that's me. But also in the book of Jonah, it shows you who the real Savior is. It shows you who the real Savior is. This book is not about a magical fish. It's about the presence of God. It's about a saving God that wants to change your life. It's about a God that meets you exactly where you're at. It's about a God of second chances. It's about a God of grace. It's about a God of mercy. I want you to see the parallels that we see in just this book to, from the gospel. Jonah wants to see the Ninevites destroyed, but God wants to see them forgiven. Jonah is giving us a picture of who the real Savior is in this chapter 1. Jonah was cast into the sea, swallowed by a fish, taken down to the deeps of the sea, and three days later he was brought back to the land of the living. It's a parallel of Jesus was cast into the ocean of God's wrath. Your sin and my sin that he didn't deserve, but he chose to run in that race for us, that he was dead and for three days that he was resurrected. Jonah did it because of his disobedience. Jesus did it because of our disobedience. Jesus did everything right, what Jonah did wrong. Jonah ran from his enemies when Jesus runs towards them. 
He runs towards his enemies. He meets you exactly where you're at to change you and to give you a life that you can't live on your own. It's another picture of Zacchaeus. He met Zacchaeus exactly where he was at because he knew that Zacchaeus couldn't change his life. He was always going to be going through another door looking for something. And Jesus said, I am that door and I am that something that you need. Put your faith and trust in me. Several parallels we see in this. Jonah was on a mission of revenge. But hear this. Jesus was on a mission of rescue. What God wants is for his people to have a heart like his. Compassion and goodness for his people. The question I have for you this morning, is there a place in your life that you're saying no to? Of giving it all to Jesus. And maybe, maybe you're in a storm because of that. Maybe just like Jonah, you, you, you've been saying no to God for several, several weeks, several years. You find yourself in this room this morning, not by accident. And you're in a storm. Storms happen in our lives for many reasons. To grow you, but also for these two things that I want to show you this morning. The storm in your life, it's not there to pay you back for your sin, but to bring you back from your sin. God is a God of grace. He's a God of mercy. He's not saying, I told you you shouldn't have done that, and because you did this, this is what I got for you. You're not in a storm, and God's just up top saying, I told you so. When are you going to come back to me? That's, that's, that's our flesh, that's our culture, that's what we live in today. I mean, I mean, what did you learn from this? You're grounded from this mistake, and, and a lot of times we penalize and give consequences for that. But that's not, that's not God, that's not agape love, that's not who Jesus is. God puts storms in your life to bring you back to him. The storm is not designed for retribution, it's designed for restoration. It's designed to point you back to the call and the purpose of your life. Hey, Jonah, I called you to go. Do you trust me? Do you you believe that I'm, I'm here for you? Then let's not worry about the middle. Just go. Just get back up and walk towards God. You don't have to get saved again. You know, once you're saved, you're always saved. Jesus Christ doesn't leave you, he doesn't forsake you, but if you've had a moment in your life that you've cried out to God to save your life and to change your life, he's never going to leave you. You just got to get back up and run back to him. And that's the story of Jonah we see here. Jonah that knows the stuff, but doesn't want to put his yes on the table. And his disobedience is... Rebellion towards God, his sin in his life, affected every single person around him. And God met him with love and compassion and goodness and said, Jonah, run back to me. That's the gospel. The book of Jonah is not about a fish. It's about a saving Christ, Messiah, that's come for you and me. And he meets you exactly where you're at, and he wants to change your life. So where are you at this morning? Has there been a time in your life that you said yes to Jesus? There's a moment that you said yes, and you've cried out to him, I need Jesus Christ to change my life. I know I'm a sinner. I'm in need of a Savior, and I need to run to him, the author and perfecter of my faith. That's where it starts. You can't say yes to Jesus in other places of your life if you can't trust Jesus in that area of your life. 
And for some of you, you you've been your church, you come to church every single week, or maybe you step foot in this room for the very first time to, to come and celebrate baptisms and to be a part of family, or or maybe you just find yourself like someone did last service that was just driving by our church and God said, You need to go. Has there been a moment in your life that you said, I'm a sinner and I need Jesus to save my life? And this morning, that next step and that yes that you need to put on the table is that right there. For some of you, maybe you need to put the yes on the table when it comes to your next step, and that's believer's baptism. There's never been a time in your life post-salvation that you've been biblically baptized, just like we celebrated today. An awesome opportunity to celebrate life change. There's no greater thing in our lives, but some of you are struggling with that. You know you're saved, and baptism it does not save you, but you can't take your next step with Jesus. And for maybe that, you're saying no, and you're that, that no is on the table, and God says, will you, just, will you just run to me? Will you trust me? Will you allow me to mold and shape your life? Maybe for some of you, you need to join this church. Partner with us in taking the gospel to Tyler and to the ends of the earth. We have a massive mission, but we have a massive God. And we need every single person to join us because it takes all of us. It's not the 20% doing more. It's all of us stepping up and stepping out and said, I'm about that. And I'm ready to go. And maybe you've been coming for weeks, maybe just recently, and it's been hard for you to put the no on the table. And you've been putting the no on the table, but you need to say yes to Jesus this morning. Maybe it's to remove a friend. Maybe it's to step out in radical generosity. I, maybe it's a sin that you need to remove. Maybe you need to come up uh, this morning and you just need to allow someone to pray over your life. That you are saying no. You are rebellion. You are rebellion. And you just need God to, to speak life into your, into your heart and mind. What, whatever it is. This is the key in Jonah 1. Run back to God. Run back to the Father. Because he's worth it. And he's greater. Do you trust him? I'm going to ask all of us to bow our head and close our eyes this morning. Maybe there's some of you this morning that you're here right now and there's never been a moment in time that you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This gospel, this great news. And right where you're at this morning, God's speaking into your heart. He's speaking into your mind. And the first thing is first, have you been changed by Jesus Christ? Has there been a time, a moment in your life that you've said yes to him. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 makes it very clear that you cannot earn salvation. You bring nothing to the table. But it's by grace through faith. Meaning that Jesus came for you. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. And this morning, maybe for the first time, maybe for a real time, you need to say, God, I need you to change my life. And I need to say yes to you for the very first time. Because that's where it starts.